So I have the honor of introducing a very good old friend of mine, Dr. Sanjay Photon Man Yoshi. Joshi. Man, I don't, I don't even know where to start with this guy, but you see a lot of changes in the reef aquarium hobby over the last five years, three years, ten years. A lot of orange glasses, a lot of really blue light tanks. And uh, this guy right here, he started from the bottom and now he's here. <laughs> um, but there's a lot you can learn from someone who has stuck to their reef aquarium principles, who has a critical mind, who's not afraid to share both his successes and his challenges. You know, if you don't make mistakes, you don't really ever learn anything. And I think Sanjay is going to teach you a lot of vicarious challenges that he's overcome. And I think that will really help you not only avoid those pitfalls, but keep your tank really on track. So give a big round of applause for Dr. Sanjay Joshi. Well, thank you everyone for coming. And thanks to Aquashella for inviting me. It's the first time I'm being at, at Aquashella, and it seems like a really cool event. When they asked me to talk here, I didn't know what to talk about. It's a little tough to talk about hardcore reefing science to an, auditor to an audience that's very diverse in terms of expertise. And this talk is basically came out of one of my conversations with uh, some hobbyists. And they said, you know, you've been doing this for 30 years. So it all should be a piece of cake for you now. And I said, no, you know, after 30 years, I still struggle. All right. So don't get disheartened if you have to struggle when you're trying to learn about keeping reefs and so on. Right. So this is kind of I said, you know what, this might be an interesting talk just to share with people that, hey, even people who have been doing it for 30 years, we still struggle with some things, okay? And maybe in the process, at least you learn that things don't happen quickly. You have to stick to it for a while, and hopefully that'll make you a better reefer in the process. So just a little bit of quick background. I mean, I started keeping aquariums back when I was a kid growing up in India, uh, freshwater fish, but I always wanted saltwater fish. Didn't start that until I came to the US and got married and I bought a house. And the first thing I did after we bought the house was buy an aquarium. <laughs> Always wanted a saltwater reef tank. Started with a small one with normal fluorescent lighting. That's what we used to do back in those days. You get, okay, I need to keep now acroporas and other difficult stony corals. So now we need metal halides. Went to a 55 with metal halides. Switched houses only because I wanted a bigger tank. All right? So convinced my wife that we needed a bigger house. So that I could get my 180-gallon tank in there, okay? And after a few years, 10 years of keeping that 180-gallon tank, I put in a 500-gallon tank, right? So, and that tank has been running now since 2006. So it's not, it's not a tank that I keep changing things and doing stuff, but the big tank is very hard to do that. So I've been just letting it run, and it's been running now for 15 years. Over the years, like any other hobbyist, you know, you find your tanks multiply. They have a very bad habit of multiplying. At one point, I had 15 tanks in my house. When I got the 500, I made a deal with my wife. I said, I'll shrink it down to two tanks. Well, I'm up to five again. So now I have two freshwater tanks also. <laughs> I've had fun with this hobby. I mean, like I said, I've been doing it for a long time. I, I like breeding fish too. So I bred some clownfish and I do that occasionally. Although in real life, I'm a professor of industrial engineering, right? I am not a biologist, I'm an engineering professor. So I treat my aquariums as an engineering project. So I want to think rationally and act rationally. So this is my 500 gallon tank, you can see the video in there. But yeah, so a lot of these corals in here are, some of them are 15 years old, right? So they've been in, in there for a long time. There's a coral in here that I got from Jake when Jake was an undergraduate student back in South Carolina somewhere. And uh, he gave me a little piece of it, and I still have it. That green one there, it's still there. It's about 14 inches in diameter now. So one of the things I like doing is I, I like to grow my corals big. I like to grow them huge. And the bigger they are, the happier I am with my corals. Like I said, the tanks multiply. So my other tanks are soft coral tanks, only because they're a little bit lower maintenance and uh, more forgiving. So you would think after 25 years or 30 years now almost of keeping reefs, keeping a reef tank would be a piece of cake. So I said, ah, you know, I can set up a new reef tank and 
get successful right away with it. And I said, I'm going to do it the way people are doing it today. Right? In the past, every reef tank I had set up always started with live rock from the ocean. Well, these days, everybody's starting tanks from with dead rock. I've been hearing complaints about how struggle it is with this dead rock. So I said, you know what, I'm going to try it myself and see if I can be successful with a reef tank starting and doing it the way people are currently advocating how to do it. So I set up a 75 gallon tank with dead rock, dead sand, and started that tank up, filled it up with corals from my big tank, and thought I'd be very successful with it right away. And guess what? You can see this tank. It's covered with cyano. I was fighting dinoflagellates in here for a long time. Fought a lot of algae that was growing in there. And I did it by the quote book that everybody was being told in the hobby that this is what you should do to set up a tank, right? So I said, you know, let me follow this new, new strategy and see. And it didn't work. So why doesn't it work? Or why didn't it work, right? I did the right things. I put dead corals, I, I put dead rock, I put dead sand, made sure there was no stuff that was going to come into my tank that was a pest put the nice lights and everything else, and all I had was problems. But two years later, that tank looks perfectly fine, right? So one of the things that I've realized is that when you start with dead stuff, dead rock, dead sand, give yourself a lot of time for the tank to be colonized by the right bacteria. The bacteria do a lot of stuff in these tanks. You can't see them, you don't know what they are, we know very little about them, but they are the things that work behind the scenes. And they're doing a lot of good stuff for you. The bacteria in the bottle, I was dumping bacteria in the bottle. Whoever told me this was a great bacteria, I said, fine, I'll try it. It doesn't really help much. The tank really has to age to a point where it can start sustaining corals and a lot of these initial startup problems go away. Cyanobacteria, xenoflagellates, algae growth, this is part of a normal cycle if you're going to set up a reef tank today. And I think it's important to learn and at least realize that it's going to take a while before it's going to look good. Now you might get lucky and it might look good in six months, or you might be like me and it took two years for where I would say it looks good now. And I've noticed this with a lot of tanks. I told Mike Paletta that and he's like, no, 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 that, that's not right. It works. I'm like, okay, Mike, you do it. Right? So he did the same thing. And he basically tore down his tank after two years. He's like, it's just it's not right. If it happens to you, just be patient, all right? Things do improve, they take time. Some of the other things that I've struggled with and I still don't have answers to, it's what we call coral RTN, or rapid tissue necrosis. Your coral looks fine one day, you come back the next day and you see this. There's a big white patch with coral tissue just peeling right off of it. And while there's a chunk of it dying, there's parts of it that are still alive. And this happens really rapidly. I mean, it's there. I went to work in the morning, came back from work, and the coral is basically gone. Or it can sometimes happen in a more of a slow pace, and slowly you'll see a coral dying and dying and dying. And it takes a while before it completely dies. It's a slow tissue necrosis. The slower one, at least you have some chance you might be able to save the coral if you made frags or did something. With RTN, it happens so quickly that it's gone. It's gone in hours. After all these years, we've seen this happen in many, many, many cases, but we don't have an answer to why it happens. I don't think there's anybody who knows why it happens. If they tell you they know what, why it happens, they're probably lying. There's no answer to this yet. So that's one thing that I still fight with sometimes. The other big problem in this hobby has always been these pests. And these seem to have increased as we've gone to coral farming and importing maricultured corals because they probably grow them in areas where there's not many predators to eat some of these and they come in and they can be really nasty, right? So there's these uh, Acropora eating flatworms. You get them in your tank in a 500 gallon tank which is packed with Acroporas, you're never gonna get them out of there. You know? There's no easy way of getting them out. So the easiest way of keeping them out is to not let them in in the first place. I've been really careful trying to do that, but still they get in, somehow or the other. And sometimes the eggs are attached to the rocks. You don't see it. So pests are really nasty. And once they get in, your only alternative sometimes is to tear down the tank and re-put the corals in and, and so on. And when you have big corals like mine, I'm not doing that. It's impossible to do. 
unless I destroy my tank. So I just let it go. I'm like, all right, you know, we can find some harmony where the pests can live with the corals and not destroy my corals. And I found it works. I mean, my tank has flat rooms right now even, but it still looks pretty good, right? So there is a balance where if things are right, the pests are there, but they kind of stay there. They don't get overwhelming in numbers. But then you can have these other pests, like these nudie branches that eat mantiparas. Those will not live in harmony with the acropora. They will destroy the mantiparas. If they get on the mantipora, it's gone. And nothing will stop them unless you essentially get rid of all the mantiparas and throw them away, essentially. Or try to treat them and treat them and so on. So those are, pests are one thing that I still struggle with. And these are the only ones that I know of. I'm sure there's other pests that are in there, like I'll find euphilias that are doing great for a year, and then all of a sudden they get this brown jelly and they're gone. No reason, I can't find a reason that explains it, right? But it happens. Other things that I struggle with sometimes is, so these mysterious, I call them mysterious fish deaths. These are fish that I've had for years and years, and they're all healthy fish. And then you come in one day and see them lying there dead. I have a habit of going to my tanks at night before the lights go out and make sure things are okay. And then in the morning before going to work, I make sure I check on them again. The night, they were perfectly fine. Came back in the morning and they were dead. And these were my, this is my tank with all my expensive fish, right? So I had a pair of karamabis, I had a pair of joculator angels, a gem tank, dead. Can't explain what happened. Again, and now you go through the trouble of restocking and finding these fish and getting them back in there. And then two years later, similar thing happened. And I'm like, well, this is really bizarre, you know? There's got to be a reason. There's got to be a reason. And this time around, I actually saw the fish struggling and dying in front of my eyes. Took them out, put them in a different tank, and the fish, one of them at least, kind of came back to life. And I said, there's got to be something toxic in the water that got in there somehow. After exploring and digging and everything, I found a cause. It was a sea cucumber that got caught in my pump and the toxins from the sea cucumber killed the fish. Now this is a sea cucumber I've had for 10 years, right? So now you think it's, a benign, it's benign, it's not done any harm, that's a great sea cucumber to have in your tank. It's a ticking time bomb. It came in and overnight, so now I got the reason for why these other ones died because I had two sea cucumbers and the first one killed the fish. First batch of fish and the second one to the second batch of fish. So, yes, putting sea cucumbers in your tank might be a good idea, but be careful that that could lead to problems down the road. One other similar problem with these mysterious fish deaths we had, this was at the Penn State tank. We have an aquarium at Penn State that I helped take care of. It's a 500 gallon aquarium too. Same thing happened. Overnight, we lost all the fish and took a lot. We couldn't find a reason for it. I talked to all the, t the big names in the hobby, like, give me a reason why this would happen. I'm like, nope, I didn't turn off the pumps. The pumps were running, everything was fine. Tank chemistry checks out okay. Again, it took me five years to figure out why they died because I was able to repeat that incident. Palitoas. We did a water change, irritated the palitoas for some reason, and the toxins from there killed all the fish. So things that we don't realize can happen. That was one of the big, big problems when we lost a lot of fish with the palatoa. But very hard to figure out because no water test is going to tell you you have toxins in your water. Dinoflagellates, nasty things. Again, I've struggled with these several times now, especially when the tank is new. There's a lot of dinoflagellates around. They never leave your system. They're always there. But once again, at times, they just find some favorable conditions and they'll just bloom like crazy. Make your tank look brownish. The good thing is they're very sensitive to light. They're photosynthetic. So if you want to eliminate some of the dinoflagellates, I'm not saying all of them, some of them, some species of them, turning the lights off and keeping the tank dark reduces their numbers and hopefully, you know, that keeps them in check. Uh, another thing I found that works is UV. You can actually get rid of you know, some of these dinoflagellates, especially these ones, with the UV. Uh, running high doses of UV, you can kill some of these dinoflagellates. But again, what's the cause of these? Why do they suddenly explode in population? 
I don't have any answers to that. Aptasia, another one that's very, something that I always struggle with. No matter what tank I've set up, somehow they always get in there. There's always Aptasia that starts to grow in there. You can find some file fish that'll eat them. No guarantee that they'll do it. No guarantee that that file fish, after it eats the Aptasia, won't eat your zoanthids and other corals, right? So there's always an associated risk with when you start to add predators to destroy something. Uh, I found that the copper bands will eat them and keep them in check, but copper bands themselves don't like to live long enough in my aquariums for whatever reason. The Australian one, what's that called? Uh, Marginalis. That's a much better fish. And that kept all the Aptasia in check. But you think the Aptasia is gone from the aquarium? It's growing in the pipes, it's growing in the sump, it's growing everywhere else. So as soon as that fish dies, I know Aptasia is coming back. So that Aptasia is a constant struggle that I've had to deal with, but it's a manageable struggle. Another nasty thing that I keep struggling with is vermitted snails. I don't know how many of you have had vermitted snails in your tank, but these are little snails that live in tubes and they cast out a net to feed and they trap the food particles in the net and then they pull that net back and feed themselves. And they can explode in population too. And once they're in there, it's very hard to get rid of them. Very hard to get rid of them. I crush them, but if you have one or two, it's okay. But when you have hundreds, you're not getting them all. Okay, and they just keep coming back. If you have large corals, it's okay. The corals can handle it. But when you have small frags and you have these rheumatid snails, growing adjacent to the frags. That net that they keep putting on the frags will ultimately kill the frag. Haven't found any good predators for rheumatid snails. Clams, I've tried many, many, many times to keep clams. They last for a few years and then they're dead. I have a nice collection of shells in my bathroom now, you know, display. That's only half of them. So over 25 years, I've tried a lot of them. And I've even got them small and I've grown them out to four or five inches and then they're done. I'm very disappointed with keeping clams. I managed to grow gigas out to 14 inches, 18 inches in size in the past, but lately, I, two years, if I get two years from a clam, that's good, that's good. So I've given up on keeping clams. A cyano we already talked about, it's always there. In all my aquariums, you cannot get rid of cyano completely, but it's again one of those things that most of the time it appears in small patches. I don't panic, it goes away on its own, and then there are times when it doesn't want to go away, right? It suddenly just takes over. And then again, you have to resort. Again, cyanobacteria is photosynthetic, so turning the lights off for a few days helps. And antibiotics will kill it, but again, with antibiotics, you don't know what else you're killing with it, right? You've got lots of bacteria in your tank. You might be killing off a lot of good bacteria. Other flatworms that I've experienced over the years, these appear on soft corals, and they can multiply. These are not the planaria. These are different than the planaria, right? These are the acylomorph flatworms that, once again, the population just exploded one time. Nothing wants to eat them. And I've gotten to the habit now where I go, I'm not fighting this. Let it go. It's not harming the corals. They just kind of cover the corals up and irritate them. Six months later, they're gone. They're not, I mean, I'm not saying they're 100% gone. There's a few might be around, but they're not around in such large numbers. My philosophy has always been, I'm not rushing out to solve these problems, right? Let me give them some time to resolve themselves, and oftentimes they do. They'll resolve themselves. Other problems that I've run into, it's a good problem. Like I said, I like to grow my corals big, but the problem is once they get that big, what do you do with them? Nobody wants that coral. I've spent five years growing that thing and it's gotten so big, it's starting to kill my other corals because it's shading them, because no light, nothing grows underneath it. It's killed everything off that was underneath it. It looks really nice, but what do I do with it? So I've done this many, many times. I've got grown these corals out big, and then luckily I have some friends who have 10,000 gallon aquariums, and I call them up and they go, hey, if you're really serious and you want some good corals, come and get this one. <laughs> he shows up, he's like, first of all, you didn't believe me that the corals are that big. He shows up with a five gallon bucket. That coral did not fit in his five gallon bucket. We ended up buying a big container from Lowe's to ship this one back. Take them out, your little fragging cutters are not gonna work. This is a job for hammer and chisel, right? So you're hammering these things to get them out of there and cutting them out. So yeah, that's a good problem, but it's also a problem that you have to deal with if the corals get too big. But these days, I think hobbies don't have that problem because once it grows from one inch to two inch, they cut it. So I don't think you guys, some of you guys will never have this problem. Other battles that I've fought and I keep struggling with is the failures of my equipment. 
and technology. So this is again, being an engineer, this is like my favorite topic here, right? I can design a system, I want to design a system that doesn't fail, or if it does fail, it fails in a safe mode and gives me a chance to correct the problem before it gets too, too bad, right? So when I first set up my aquarium, my 29 gallon tank, it was set up with a sump and one pump feeding into the tank, went on vacation, came back, that main pump had stopped working, tank was dying, right? Three days, no circulation in the tank. You look at it and go, man, that's a dumb way to do it. I should have used two return pumps. And that way, if one failed, the other one would have kept working and I would still be okay. So I've gone through my whole tank setup now, try to minimize the impact of a failure of an equipment. Returns, I always have redundant redundancy built into it. Water flow in the tank, I put several pumps there. So if one fails, nothing is gonna go wrong. Um, in the, when I first got into the hobby, I used to panic if my protein skimmer wasn't working. Now I go, eh, protein skimmer can fail and I can keep my tank going without a skimmer for months. That's not a big deal. I, I go through all my equipment and see how it's gonna fail and what the implications might be on my tank. Over the years, every time I find something, I tweak it. I never go back to the same state. I go, man, eh, if you go back, the same thing can happen again, right? So let me fix the problem somehow. I keep doing this with all my equipment. Uh, so I always keep backup equipment in case, I'm in, a, in case of an emergency because where I live, there's no pet shops. I rely on mail order. So that would take me three days to get something if I'm lucky. These days it might take you months to get it. So keeping backups, uh, doing some of the design and thinking through the failures and the impact or the implications of those failures is very important. Because once you have equipment, you know it's going to fail. It's always going to fail at some point. And if you're a believer of Murphy, it's going to fail when you don't want it to fail. So with all my travels and everything, I've tweaked my tanks in such a way now, I've left them for a month and not had issues with it, right? Uh, or I've put in enough alarms and automation that if there is a problem, I can at least call a friend and say, go fix this, you know? This is a problem with my tank. Uh, so that's very important. And it's very important to simulate the failures. I always tell people, just go through and simulate them, right? So that you feel comfortable. Go in and turn off one of your pumps and see what would happen. The first time I designed my system, you turn off the pump, the water overflows into the sump, works great. Snail gets in there now, right? Now the snail blocks my pipe, the sump is being pumped, overflows my tank. Right? And it happens on, when I'm gone out of town, of course. It never happens when I'm around. It happens when my wife is around, but when I'm, and then she has to call me and she's all upset because now she has to deal with the mess that I've created. Right? So that's the, con I said, no, right, I'll, I'll take care, I'll make sure these things won't happen. Things that we never think about. Oh, a snail's gonna get stuck in this pipe now? That won't happen, you know? A cucumber is gonna get into my pump after 12 years of not getting into my pump? Anemones. I never put anemones in my tank, especially with a pump where they can get sucked into. Never, because it's the same thing. For years and years, they won't move. And then one day they decide to move. They get into your pump. So one way of avoiding some of these problems is just don't do it. Don't put a sea cucumber in your tank. It's gonna climb the walls and get into your pumps. And that means they're gonna just take off one day. So in spite of all of that, I've taken care of my equipment. I don't like to use what I would call like a single point of failure that would destroy my tank. And controllers are one of those things. Right? People put so much faith into a controller that they have their tanks running on full automation using the controller. If the controller dies, you're done. You've lost all control of the tank. So I use a controller. I like the controllers, but I use them as a monitor. I don't let the controller make any decisions on my tank. I make those decisions. Let the controller send me a message and I'll take care of the problem. So here's a story about, again, failures with technology. I was gone, this was Macna. I went to a Macna in 2013 and I had set up my system where, yeah, if anything goes wrong, it's gonna send me a message. So I'm at Macna having a great time, not even thinking about my tank, partying away. Came back home, parked my car in the garage, opened the door, I told my wife, you deal with the car and the bags and everything, my tank is dead. She goes, no, it's not. Well, how do you know it's dead? I can smell it. 
I can smell the dead Acropora already, you know? So I run down there and I said, what, what the hell happened here, you know? So if, so if my, something was gonna go wrong, it should have told me something was wrong. So I, dead fish floating up there, I, I go to grab the fish to take them out, and the water felt really hot. And I said, really, the water is that hot? So I looked at my controller, the temperature was hitting 90 degrees every single day that I was gone. But I still had some fish alive and, and stuff. So first thing I did was send my wife off to go get bags and bags and bags of ice. <laughs> and I'm like, how do I bring the temperature down? It's at 92 degrees, you know, and the fish are dying. So I dumped ice in there. Ice was melting so fast. It took a while before the temperature started to drop. And you can see in that graph, it started to come down. Right? But then I went back and said, what, what failed here? Controller is working. It's recording everything correctly. And I got no message from the controller. The temperature is down 90 degrees. The service that I was using to send me the message changed their protocol. And I didn't get any message. And that just happened two days before I left for the vacation. So I didn't even probably ignored their email or whatever and didn't pay attention to it and became a victim to this problem. So now, how do you fix that problem? Right? This can happen to anybody, right? Controller doesn't send you a message because of some fit. So now I have my controller set up to send me a message every day at nine o'clock in the morning. So every day at nine o'clock in the morning, my phone buzzes. My wife goes, your mistress is calling you. <laughs> but yep, so if I don't get that message nine o'clock in the morning, I know my controller is not talking to me. Right? So that's one way of me trying to solve this problem. But yeah, it, it's not fun when you have to do this, you know? When you have to go in and hack out tons of dead coral because of one simple problem with technology and equipment. So that, that was really nasty again. I lost not a whole bunch of fish, expensive fish. And then the last thing, these fall into the category of what I call stupid human mistakes. It shouldn't even be human mistakes, it'd be stupid Sanjay mistakes. There are things that we do, we don't realize, and then you go back and say, damn, why did I do this? You know, why do I do this? And that's cost me several losses too in this whole process, right? Uh, one time in a rush, was leaving somewhere, I had to get the water levels were low, I had to do some water changes, and I didn't have enough RO water. I used tap water. I said, eh, you know, what, what's tap water? It's a little bit of tap water. Those chloramines messed up my tank. That's what I call a stupid human mistake. Or sometimes I'll leave a hose in there. To do, I did a water change, left the hose in there, unplugged it from this side, didn't unplug it from the other side, and it just siphoned the whole tank out. Stupid human mistakes. So I'm sure we've all done that, I've done that, and these are the ones that are the hardest ones to take care of, right? Because you're making those mistakes. It's not technology. There's no other reason except either being lazy or being forgetful or taking a shortcut when you shouldn't have. That's what I've learned over 25 years. And I keep my fingers crossed that I have my tanks now at least dialed in to the point where a lot of these things shouldn't happen. There are things still that can go wrong Right? Uh, this is another situation that happened one time. I don't plan for it. I had my metal halides hanging up on the tank using a pulley so I could pull them, move them up and down. Uh, one day the metal halide, the pulley broke and the metal halide went crashing into the tank. That tank could not keep fish for two years after that. The metal halide exploded in that tank. Right? So all the metals that are in those gases and everything that they put in the bulb just poisoned that tank. Two years, you couldn't keep a fish in there. So things that you don't even think about. Uh, who thought the pulley would break? Now, if I have something hanging, I make sure that it's not hanging by one chain. It's got two. <laughs> it's gonna at least have a chance of not going into my tank. Lots of stories of leaving razor blades on top of the rim of the tank and then forgetting to take them and then they fall into the tank and you can't find them. And then you start struggling with What's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? You know, eh? that was a razor blade that fell in there. It's okay in a 500 gallon tank. It's not okay in a 20 gallon tank. I'm gonna stop here. I'll take questions for a while. If anybody has any questions. <laughs> the question was, what do you hope to learn in the next 25 years? 
I hope I'm not going to make the same mistakes again. Right? So I'm hoping by now I've shrunk the number of mistakes I can make. But the nice thing about this hobby is there's a lot to learn. Not just about keeping stuff alive, right? There's so many different animals, there's so many different things, and there's so much happening in the hobby that's exciting again, right? That people are able to now spawn corals in their aquariums. That's really exciting. So there's a lot of exciting things. Someday I, I want to do that. I want them to spawn in my tank. I know they spawn, but I want to manipulate the timing when they would spawn. I don't want to wake up at 3 in the morning every day and look at see if they have spawned. Breeding fish. I enjoy breeding fish. It's just too time consuming, but it's fun. Kills your vacations. That's part of the reason why I don't do enough of it. Because you can't leave those little babies and go away for a while and then hope that they'll, al they'll be alive. What's the most difficult coral you grow? The most difficult coral? Depends on the tank. If I look at my 500 gallon tank, which is very high water flow and strong light, if I put scolies in there, they're gone within a week or two, two weeks. They don't survive. Um, it depends on the fish you have. I keep a lot of angel fish. I, have a lot, I, I keep pa pairs of fish, so they, they spawn every night in my tank. But angel fish have a habit of nipping stuff, right? So but in a 500 gallon tank, they can keep nipping on corals and I don't really care. But if you have like brain corals and things, they'll kill them, they'll kill them. So it's a combination of what the tank is and what I'm trying to do. Like right now I put two file fish in my tank, orange spot file fish. They're supposed to eat Acropora polyps. They haven't killed a single coral in my tank yet, but there's no polyp extension on any coral because they pick on it in the day. At night, they're all, there's full polyp extension. I was just wondering, do you dip your SPS corals the same as any other coral, like for the length of time or the same, same brand of treatment, same type of dip? Do you treat them the same as other corals? I mean, I try to keep corals in there that will live the way I take care of my tank, right? So that's the one thing that I try to tell people. I don't like to fight my systems anymore, right? So if a coral is happy in my tank, it lives. Sure, sure. I guess what I'm, what I'm more wondering is when you're, when you're dipping your SPS before you put it in your tank, do you, do you dip it in the same solution that you dip your other corals in? Do you treat your SPS when you dip it the same as... as no, any? I just use the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Same time duration and... Yeah. Okay. It Good. seems to work. Yeah. I've okay. been using the bear, bear insecticide thing. Okay. Yeah. That seems to be working for me. Okay. I, I didn't know if there was more, uh, you know, susceptible SPS like you noticed. So this no, SPS, I put a uh, certain concentration and I use five minutes as my standard time. Five minutes, yeah. Okay. And that seems to be Excellent. okay. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks for coming.